What a ride it's been. Persona 5, the Royal came out maybe two months ago, almost, actually. And I've just been playing the game. Including the Japanese playthrough, I've played this game a grand total of about four times. Three times in the past two months, which is wildly unhealthy. Um, need to, you know, need to get need to get a life, but you know that's not really happening right now, considering the current state of the world. So, putting all that aside, I'd like to share my spoiler thoughts on Persona 5 The Royal, so that means that there will be spoilers from here on out. Everything in this video is spoilers for Royal content, not just the base game. In fact, we probably won't be talking about the base game very much. So with that in mind, I hope you guys like this. So starting off, I want to talk about the new characters. Let's talk about Jose, as they pronounce it in-game. Um, Jose is the little egg boy who is in Mementos and essentially makes Mementos more of a collectathon. I think that's a good thing, for the most part. It gives you something else to do in Mementos besides playing through Mementos, which is a daunting task at that. But all things considered, not a huge deal. Now he has a stamp collection, which is also very helpful because you get more EXP, more money, more items when you collect more stamps and use them for him to change mementos with. It's a good mechanic, but Jose as a character doesn't really add a lot, I want to say. He's interesting, but that's because he has so few answers to the questions he mentions like the person who asked him to research humanity he has the same yellow eyes as shadows or as the velvet room attendants curious what he'll be what his role will be later on because he's probably gonna return later don't know for sure but you know he's pretty unexplained and the wishing star is also unexplained he just says it grants wishes, and then we use it for showtimes, and then it dies at the end of the game. We'll come back to the Wishing Star later. But, Jose's a good character. He's a good addition to the game. Though he doesn't add much in terms of character. He adds a lot in terms of gameplay, in my opinion at least. And it makes Mementos all the more enjoyable. And speaking of Mementos... They gave Mementos new themes, which is really good, because didn't wasn't digging that original Mementos theme for, you know, 60 plus floors of the same dungeon. Well, it wasn't very fun. Now moving on to the bigger characters, let's start with Akechi. Akechi has a interactive confidant in the game, which means, which by that I mean he does not progress through the story for the most part, the ranks 2 through 8 are done as regular confidant. And I think it flushes out his character a bit more, which I believe they also do in the anime, but seeing as that I was not a huge fan of the anime, I couldn't really get into it. But putting that aside, in Royal they really flush out his character and seeing him return in the royal arc of the game is fantastic. It really helps you kind of get a better idea of who he is, because in the base game, he was a pretty, I think he was pretty well developed in the base game, but some people felt that it was his development was a little weak. I've seen that some people actually like him more now that the royal arc thing has happened, and that's good. I think <clears throat> I think that the important thing to understand with Akechi's character is that he's not a character that should be like, you know, the role model kind of character because he's a fucking murderer, but he is a 
good character. And if you like him, that's cool. If you don't, then you don't. Now, going back to the Wishing Star, actually, I think Akechi is quite interesting in that regard. Because he's... Alright, so... He's actually dead, right? But in the end credits, we see him alive, potentially. They don't show the face, which means it might not be him, but it could be. You know, or it might be Akira, Ren, just hallucinating, or, you know, whatever. But he wasn't even looking out the window, so it's debatable. So, the wishing star, my theory on it, is that it dies after the whole royal arc is over. Which could be because the metaverse is gone, but they don't bring it up in the scenes between Yaldabaoth and um, the start of Maruki's arc. Though I guess the metaverse wasn't actually erased, technically speaking. But putting that aside, it's weird because the wishing star is dead and they assume it's because Morgana's transformation into a helicopter, right? But, I'm thinking, the Wishing Star can actually grant one wish, and that wish was Akira's, or Ren's, because it was in his pocket, right? So, I personally don't think, maybe that's how Akechi's alive. If he is, I don't know how they're going to explain it. I hope they do, and it's something a little you know little with a little bit of substance and not just yeah i lived which you know sure you know that works that's that's how he explains it in the in the royal arc even though you know he knows he's or he assumes he's dead but that's how he explains it there so you know now moving on from akechi let's talk about sumire yoshizawa Sumire is a very well-developed character, and I think a really good thing about her character is that she appears early in the game and has scenes that are exclusive to her. They're not, she's not added into scenes, like, she doesn't join us in, like, Shido's palace and is just there in, like, the scenes where we're, like, you know, convinced we're, like, trying to get the letters of recommendation and she's just there. You know, she has nothing to add. It it feels natural because, and yes, it's annoying that she's not like in in the story. Like she's not in Shido's palace. I want to use her before that. She gets her persona during the Okumura arc. Why couldn't we use her during the other arcs? But it works a lot better. It feels a lot more natural in my opinion because when you take characters who weren't in the game originally or weren't in certain parts originally just insert them in it's awkward especially if you've played the previous game like example tales of vesperia their characters like patty and i think maybe flynn i'm not entirely sure about that one don't quote me on it but these characters weren't in those certain in certain parts in the base game and now they're just suddenly here so they're like they're suddenly playable so they're part of your party and now they're just there in these scenes and it just kind of happens and it's really bizarre because they just kind of appear and they don't really and the other party doesn't interact with them but overall sumire feels like a very natural addition to the cast and i think that's great because because natural additions are very important when you're trying to restructure a plot with a new character in it. Now moving on to Takedo Maruki, or Dr. Maruki. He's a fantastic antagonist, and honestly has a better boss fight than Yaldaba, which I'll go into later. His motivation, which on the surface is fan- is like, it's good motivation. It's, you know, he's not really a bad guy. When you go under analysis of it, there's several problems with it. Not everyone can really actually be happy at the same time. It's a whole mess of things. And the social inabilities you get from him are really good. But putting that aside, Arky is a fantastic character with a lot of interesting 
dialogue, I guess, and I really like his character. I didn't, didn't really like the weird tentacle things, tentacle persona. Not, not great, but, you know, overall, that stuff doesn't matter in the long run. Now, the Royal Arc itself is a really great addition to the story, and the reason why is because I think it builds on top of the story instead of just segmenting off of it. Because you know that you're going to see Margie again, but when's he going to appear? And suddenly he appears, he's been studying cognitive science his whole life, and now he's in the metaverse as a palace ruler. And that's crazy, that's like a, you expect it, you see it coming, and at the same time, you're like, oh, but he's not a shadow, he's a persona user, and that, you know, that's, it just builds on top of that interest in him as a character. Adding on to that, in the Royal Arc, there are the Third Awakenings for your party, and they're all cool, and they have busted skills, and I love that, because the game doesn't try to make itself balanced, it lets you and your party be busted, and if you exploit that, it's honestly so cool. I love games that do that, especially single, more single-player games, where it lets you be super strong, because that's kind of just how it is. A little thing with me with the Royal Arc is that I felt it was weird that some scenes lacked voicing, specifically the Third Awakening scenes. For some reason, all of them have no voice acting in them, which I don't have anything against, but I just thought it was a little weird because like these are kind of important scenes for these characters. and. I get why, like, you know, budget concerns, maybe they didn't have the materials on time, translations took a while, whatever the case may be. You know, I don't know the intricate, like, the insider stuff about this, about voice work, but... I don't know, it's just weird to not have it voiced, I guess. I thought it, I thought it would be. It could use the voicing, honestly. But, you know, they did add a lot of voicing to the base game, and that's great, because... Some scenes in the base game also didn't get voiced, even though they're really important. But that's how it is. It doesn't change my view of the game, I just thought it was a little weird, I guess. Don't really know a better word to describe it. Nothing against anyone who had anything to do with the localization of the game, because it's done very well, in my opinion. Now, Maruki has an antagonist fantastic, as I said before, because I thought he was going to go like a villain route, and it turned out he was not, he's not a villain, he's just trying to stop all suffering, which, you know, antagonist, not villain, very different things, or could be similar, but also very different. Bring Back Akechi is great due to his popularity overseas in Japan, or natively in Japan because the game's Japanese or whatever. And it's also good, I think, being able to use him with him as himself, as the... Uh, what's it for? The crazy psychotic Akechi, who's super serious and doesn't put up a fake smile doesn't really give a shit about anything except for his goal. Really love that. Really love that. Like to use Loki too. It was awesome. And the final boss fight for Royal is so good because it utilizes the mechanics of the game much more. Baton passing. Maruki can actually cut out your ability to use certain skills. It's you know, you have to hit the weaknesses and all of that, and even maybe switch party members if you're not overpowered. It's not just... Because the Yaldabaoth's fight is like... Yeah, he does different status effect things, but sometimes they don't even do anything at the right time. 
and it's basically just a charge or concentrate into an AoE almighty attack or something, and then you heal and you repeat, and you just keep doing that, and then eventually Alaboth is dead. And you can approach Maruki's fight like that, but the first phase of his fight uses everything on you. And then the second phase of the fight is a little more traditional to regular boss fights where you're not really targeting weaknesses, you're just hitting him as hard as you can, perfectly fine with that. But, yeah, I just enjoyed that boss fight so much more. And then the third phase is like, you just, you're just defending, and then it goes a cutscene finale, and then you punch Maruki three times, and whatever. It's good. It's just really good. The finale of taking down Maruki isn't as grand as Satin Isle versus Yaldaba, but I feel like it's more meaningful than that than that finale. And I really liked the end cutscene. It was just it, it it was stitched together very well, I have to say. And the ending there was I remember when the ending came out the true ending came out with the Japanese game release. People on the subreddit were talking about it for Persona 5, and there were mixed opinions. There are a lot of mixed opinions, not sure about now. I've heard some people don't like it, but I think the ending's a lot better than the original game because it establishes that each character has grown and is moving forward with their lives. So they, through Marky's real reality, they realize that they have dreams and desires, things they want to chase, and to do that, Sometimes, just like in real life, you gotta leave things behind to keep moving forward. And I think that's a fantastic message to kind of send off the game with, is that, you know, you can't always be with everyone you love, you know, you gotta keep moving, you wanna achieve your dreams, you gotta keep going forward, and that's, it's a good message. And. I did enjoy that they did that with this game. In a way, I guess, it reminds me of... Persona 4 Arena's ending, where they talk about all the characters moving forward with their lives. But, we're not here to get into Arena spoilers and all that. If you guys want to play Arena and all that, I don't want to spoil any of that for you guys. For anyone watching, that is, I guess. But, regardless, I think the ending gives a better closure to the characters in a way. It starts them off on these new arcs, but it gave me a sense of like, oh, these characters, what are they going to do after this? Oh, Ryuji's going to go and rejoin a track team, An's going to learn to study abroad for their, her modeling career. Haru and Makoto are going to college, but that was already in the original game. Um, Sumiri is going to keep pushing herself in her gymnastics. Um, Morgana is going to be a cat. And Futaba is going to high school, which I think that was established in the other game, in the base ending for P5, but, you know, still a good thing. And Yusuke is going to keep finishing his painting. Oh, the ending does a lot for me personally. I just think that it's a lot better than the original where you're just, you know, together forever. You know, it's a happy ending, but, you know, it's... You know. It doesn't send a message as strong as this one did. And a message that I guess resonates with me as well. In some ways. Now getting on to gameplay mechanics. Showtimes. Flashy, over the top, that's all I really want out of these kinds of attacks. They're awesome, only gripe is that they have some weird exclusions. I think Ryuji and Joker should have got one, I mean, come on. Like, those two really needed, I feel like they really needed one. Would have been perfect, or everyone gets one with Joker, which would be oversaturating, I guess, but still be awesome. I, I feel like... You know, Joker as the protagonist, the leader of the Phantom Thieves, you know, deserved showtimes with everyone else. But that's me being a little 
greedy there. I'm sure, you know, there are good reasons to only have two per character so that you can get to see all of them and it's not just the same showtime over and over again. And I also thought, since everyone has two, right, so Sumiri and Akechi should have one together. Not because they, like, synergize well together or anything like that, just because, like, I feel like it would be pretty amusing, since Sumire is kind of not, you know, it's kind of scared of Akechi, and Akechi doesn't really give a shit about her, since he, you know, says that he would just kill her if he had the choice when she comes out to fight you. But, you know, just for the sake of everyone having two, I thought those two should have one together, but not a big deal, like I said. Now, darts, billiards, jazz club, Kichijoji in general. Pretty good hub area, or not hub area, but pretty good overworld area. It's nice, you know. The darts and billiards are fun, or billiards, you just kind of stand there. But the darts minigame is fun, um, and it also helps get your baton pass ranking up for battle, which is, you know, that's the best part about all the side stuff in this game. And Jazz Club lets use K get charged. <laughs> I mean, what more can I say about that one? Now, Will Seeds. Will Seeds give some good skills, and I like how, even if they're skills that already exist in the game, like, uh, like, Tarukaja and. Tar not Tarunda. Um, and, like, Masusukaja and. Yeah, skills like that. They have like special animations like the vault for Kanashiro's that raises everyone's defense. Really good. The the um, Tyrant's Will, President Insight, which are charge and concentrate, except you can cast them on anyone on the field or anyone on your team, which is really good skills. And also just, I really like that. Though, having those skills was very nice. But, yeah, the will seeds were pretty interesting. I thought they were just gonna give, like, basic skills, but they actually gave a decent amount of... a decent set of skills. Nice to have. And even Marky has one if you put it into New Game Plus. He gets Guiding Tendril, which is broken, and it's great. I don't know, the will seat's just a really good addition that I didn't think I would really care for that much. Now, let's get into a little bit of nitty gritty stuff. Something negative, I guess I could say about the game. DLC practices. A lot of people critical on Atlas for that. To me, I don't think it's as bad when you look at but like the volume of the DLC is a bit much. I think like the pricing isn't actually that bad. Like cop costumes, nine costumes for seven bucks isn't really that bad. Nine costumes with this music track, still not that bad. Q2 probably shouldn't have been its own thing, like a pack that expensive because the assets already exist, but I don't know what goes into transferring a 3DS asset to a PS4 asset with those animations, you know, might be a lot, a lot of work, don't really know. Music files, I know, are not as big of a deal, or that's what I've heard, at least. But, I don't think the pricing is that bad. I think the weirdest things, these are all weird choices, Yoshizawa's pack is weird because it's 18 costumes, $15, which rounds out to a little bit more expensive than 9 costumes for $7, or 8 costumes for $7. But... I think Yoshi's Always Pack is a little bit weird, just because some of them, some of those costumes I think are free. Like the Legacy Bundle stuff is free. And I understand these are brand new costumes being made, so paying for them is reasonable because, you know, it's less than a dollar for each costume. I guess it depends on the region you're in, but USA, less than a dollar for each costume. So. You know, it's probably for money reasons they put it all into one pack, so you have to buy that pack, but, you know, I don't really see that big of a deal with it, because, for the most part, you have that legacy bundle, and it has, like, 
everything from the first Persona 5 in it. So there are tons of costumes. You don't need the Featherman ones, the Velvet Room ones. You know, they're cool, but not a necessity. You know, it's up to you, but yeah. Okay, challenge pack. This one is questionable. This is the big one that I'm like, eh, don't really like the pricing. 10 bucks, I believe it's two battles. And it's the P3, P4 protagonist. It's an awesome set of battles, but $10? For boss fight? For for boss fight, it's not even that hard? Not not a huge fan. Sorry, sorry, Atlas, not a huge fan of that one. Joker's third tier persona, Raul, is locked behind a paywall. Don't know why they did that. Um, my best guess as to why this persona even exists, because even in Persona 4 Golden, uh, never mind, we won't even get there. Um, won't mention it, but Joker's third tier persona was probably designed conceptually, but they never had a reason for him to show up in the game like they probably had it planned in there that oh maybe he'll show up here or maybe he'll show up there or, you know you'll unlock it probably not the unlock it thing since they put it behind a paywall but <clears throat> well i guess you pay to unlock it now haha -ha. because he's not in the plot that's funny right yeah but it's weird it's it's such a weird choice so i guess they had him as a concept so they were like let's just design it into a persona put it in the game you can buy it if you want it Sure, I guess, you know, not a, not great, not a huge fan of that, but, eh, you know, you can do without it. Satanile's still a better Persona overall. Uh, the rest of the Persona packs, I think Izanagi no Okami and Messiah, I believe, are the two. Uh, not great, not bad in terms of pricing, it's like three bucks, I think. They're broken, though. I know Izanagi no Okami is just completely busted but I don't I don't remember if Messiah is or not I didn't really use it use him that much I don't think it's an I don't think the DLC is an atrocity overall I think it's fine just people aren't like super happy with it and I understand why Legacy's free so you kind of just get the bulk of the DLC anyways for free so you might as well just get the legacy pack and leave the rest unless you really want it or just wait for it to go on sale probably go on sale eventually you know game's been out two months you know if you haven't played p5r yet then dlc will probably go on sale eventually you know a few months down the line 50 percent off base game 50 percent off dlc buy it together 60 bucks not bad all right back to game mechanics alarm in the velvet room fantastic idea makes getting 99 stat personas like it's less tedious and more tedious at the same time, it's less tedious because you don't have to back in and back out till the right stats are highlighted. You can just slam strengthening during alarms to boost level, and then slam strengthening again to boost stats, and you keep doing that till they hit 99 in everything, and it's it's great. And it's not time gated anymore because you can trigger as many alarms as you want during palaces. And Chia's confidant rank eight also actually makes it a lot easier to get alarms in the metaverse so you might as well activate that every time you want to grind personas up and the fusions are more fun because you know you get the randomized skills you also get those traits which aren't exclusive to the alarms but I forgot to mention it before the traits on the personas it's it's cool and it's a great way to make you like stronger which you know busted that's important in these kinds of games you know you want to be busted or maybe you don't it's up to you but soundtrack for the game absolutely amazing it's a stellar soundtrack i loved it i believe throw in your mask and colors flying eye just a few examples of really good songs really like all the new songs and Man, don't know how they do it, but every Persona game has, like, a truckload of songs that I really enjoy. 
So to top it all off, this is the definitive edition of Persona 5. Has the best gameplay in the series. Best story, in my opinion. I still like P4's cast more than P5, but P5 still has games coming, scrambles coming to the US and Europe and everywhere else, hopefully. <laughs> that survey was not very, uh, the survey they sent out was not very um, encouraging that they're working on localization, but whatever, I, I think it's coming. There's no way they're gonna back out of that. And Arena could come sometime in the next few years, you know, with the pandemic, I don't know if it's getting delayed, with Arxis probably working on it and Guilty Gear getting delayed. I don't know if the teams are exactly, I don't think the teams are the same, but, you know, it could still get delayed is what I'm saying. And it might not be coming out until 2022, but, you know, it'll come eventually, and that's what's important. Uh, would definitely recommend this game, especially during current times, because we're indoors all the time, you know, you can't really go out and hang out with friends and stuff, so... 100 hours of your time for Persona 5 Royal? Not a bad deal, if I do say so myself. It's the best game I've played so far this year, and I have high expectations for the main series going forward. Now, main series games not just not like you know my expectations for like dancing games are more tempered especially after the kind of shit show that was p5 dancing where it's like you could have waited two years and put in more songs you guys knew you had a definitive edition coming for p5 and you know you'd have to make this game right away pq2 was like a year out like you know come on but putting that aside not my place to speak, I don't run a business. But overall, if you want an arbitrary number, here it is, you know. Obviously I've spoken so highly about this game that like, yeah, you know, I'm a huge fan. Well, but that's been my thoughts on Persona 5 The Royal, you know. I'm sure if you're watching this and, you know, for whatever reason you are, you've probably seen the story and all that, you know, not much else to be experienced in the game, might even have the game, you know, you never know. But yeah, that's been me, my thoughts on P5R, thanks for watching.